This is a desalting cone, short and stout. Small things stay in, while bigger things flow out. The reason why this happens is they take a shorter route. So put your sample in and swap those buffers out. So these are desalting columns um, or buffer exchange columns. And so these small ones, I typically use them to remove radioactive ATP from RNA after a labeling reaction. And there are also um, ones that you can use for like proteins for desalting, um, removing various salts and other small molecules that might interfere with downstream steps, things like TRIS or EDTA that might be incompatible with future things. Um, you can and exchange basically exchange the buffer so that you're putting it in a liquid that it, you want it to be in and so it is an alternative when you're doing it for proteins and stuff it is an alternative to dialysis we'll talk about some of the pros and cons of different methods but the same principles are at play in each of these different things I remember how shocked I was when I first learned that these these little desalting columns work using the same principles as these giant size exclusion columns and analytical size exclusion columns. Yep, inside of here and inside of here is a similar type of resin. These are size exclusion um, chromatography resins. Um, so sometimes this is referred to as gel filtration. The basic idea is that there are these little beads which have these pores like secret tunnels and molecules can only get into those tunnels if they can fit through the, um, fit through the entrance. So bigger things are going to have access to fewer of the tunnels and so they're going to travel a shorter distance because they get to kind of like go around. The difference with between like preparative and analytical size exclusion chromatography where we're actually trying to separate things like proteins from one another. When you're doing a desalting or buffer exchange, it's more of a group separation. So you're trying to separate really big things or at least big-ish things from really, really tiny things. And so in this case, the pores and the beads are really, really tiny. And so the little, the tiny things like salts and labels and dyes are going to get stuck um, in the beads. Whereas the bigger things are just, they can't go through any of the pores. So basically they come out through like the void volume. So when we're doing this with like stuff to separate proteins during like a purification, what we want to do is we want to avoid the void because we want our protein to actually be going through some of the pores, but proteins are going to go through different, different like pass through the pores because the bigger ones can't get through as many. So they're going to take a shorter route than the little ones which have to go through all of them but only like things that are really, really, really big, like aggregated proteins would come out in the void. So they would avoid all of the pores. They couldn't get through any and they would come out in the outer, outside of that. But when we're talking about desalting, here we want the protein to actually be in the void or our nucleic acid, whatever we're working with. We want it to actually be coming out in the void. We want it to be going around all of the pores. And so the pores here are going to be really, really tiny. And so only really, really tiny stuff is going to get stuck. And so your protein or your nucleic acid, whatever you're trying to desalt is going to be coming out with whatever was in the beads to start with. So you equilibrate your beads to begin with, you fill them with the buffer you want them to come out with, and then when they come out, they're going to be coming out in the buffer that you want. So let's go in more detail and also take a look at how we do it in practice. Although these things might seem totally different, they actually have the same concept at their heart that the bigger things are going to have access to less of the actual volume inside of the column, whereas the smaller things are going to have access to a larger volume. So with these columns, they're filled with these little beads and these beads have different size pores. I like to think of them kind of as tunnels and the and cars. And so the bigger cars don't have, they can't get into all of the tunnels. And so they're going to take a shorter route to, to the end than the smaller things. So I like to think of them as these tunnels. They're really just like these pores and you can imagine just things like wandering in and around and dead ends and all sorts of stuff. And so you have this kind of movement of things in and out and the, the in and outness that you can do depends on your size. And so the bigger, th the really small things like salts, they're going to access the entire column, column volume and go really slowly. If things are in the separating range of the resin, then they're going to access some of the tunnels, but not others. And so they're too big to wander into some of them, but they can wander into other ones. And so they'll have access to part of the, like the whole volume, but not the rest. So if you imagine like the total volume would be the volume of the liquid around the beads, 
We call this the void volume, as well as the volume inside of the beads. And so the things that are really, really big that are above the exclusion limit of the resin, they, are, they can't access any of the pores. So they're going to go around all of these beads and they're going to come out in the void volume. And so what's going to happen is that when we're doing a purification, when we're doing something like a preparative or analytical seek, where we're actually trying to separate proteins by size and actually, so we're separating like proteins from one another. In this case, we want those proteins to be in the separating range of the resin. So they're going to access part of it, but not all. And the the partness that they can access is going to depend on their size. So smaller things are going to have access to more of this. So the really small things are going to have access to all of them. But this is hopefully all the proteins that you're wanting to separate are going to be in the range where they have access to some of these, but not all of these, but different amounts to each of them. So you can imagine that some of these would have access to some of these tunnels, but not others. The smaller you are, the more tunnels you have access to. And therefore, these are going to come out at different times. And then you can do what, what you want to do, whether you want to just look at them with like analytical, or if you want to actually then collect the fractions that they came out with. So you take fractions in a little fraction collector as they're coming off the column. You can capture them as they come off and then isolate them and do whatever you want to do with them. So you want to avoid the void in that case. When, we're when we think about the void, when we're doing that sort of thing, the void is going to represent aggregates and stuff like that, that comes off before anything else uh, because it's going around all of those beads. And, our, and when we're doing this, we don't want our stuff to be in, the, in that void fraction. So um, Saitava, um, they, the people that make the actin and make a lot of these columns, I don't work for them or anything, but I use their stuff and they have some really great resources like um, their size exclusion chromatography handbook. So these are some of the resins that are often used for this type of size exclusion when we're doing like a protein purification. And you can see that it's showing you like the fractionation range. Um, so this is like the separating range. So you want the proteins that you want to separate, you want them to be in this range. There are also differences in terms of like when it comes to choosing a resin, there are differences in terms of the like the higher the resolution that you're going to get, the, like the based on like the size of the beads, like the smaller ones are going to give you like a higher resolution, but then you have higher pressure, um, various things to contend with. But when you're looking at these types of resins, um, you're looking at the like the separating range and you're aiming to be in that separating range. And so some of these have a bigger range. And so you want to choose like the smallest range typically that your proteins that you want are going to be in because then you're going to get better separation between those. But if you have a really big range of things, then you want a wide range. Um, and so these beads are typically things like agarose, cross-linked agarose, cross-linked agarose mixed with dextrose, um, dextran, things like that. However, when you want to do a when you want to do one of these desalting or buffer exchanges, one of these group separations, here what you want to be is instead of looking at the separating range, you're looking at the exclusion limit. And you want to make sure that the thing that you want to separate is going to be above the exclusion limit. So you can see that these are typically, um, a lot of times these use Cepidex, which is a cross-linked dextran. So it's this sugar, um, this cross-linked sugar. Um, cross-linked with epichlorohydrin. Um, but basically you can see that these have different particle sizes as well as different separation ranges. Although typically these separation ranges aren't very useful for things that like proteins. And instead you're looking at the exclusion limit. And so instead of looking at being in that range, you're just looking at being far above it. And so it, you want to make sure that the thing that, you're, that you want to separate is going to be far above the the exclusion limit. And so, for example, ones I commonly use when I'm doing nucleic acid, working with nucleic acids are like these G50 um, and G25. And so the G50 is going to be good if my DNA is bigger than 20 bases, whereas the G25, I would use that if I had something smaller, um, so greater than 10 bases in length. So typically when I'm using them, it's because I'm doing some five prime end labeling of RNA. So I'm basically taking RNA and I'm adding a radioactive phosphate group 
You can also do this with DNA. And this is really helpful because then you could use these as probes or you could use these to test protein binding, various things like that. Uh, you just have to do this easy reaction where you add this polynucleotide kinase, which is going to actually transfer in radioactive ATP, and then it transfers the ATP, the radioactive one, phosphate group onto your RNA or your DNA, and now you have labeled, but you have a bunch of excess ATP, and so you can do this cleanup where you remove that excess ATP. Um, and now when you run like a urea page gel, you should see that you have your protein bands and you shouldn't have like a bunch of free ATP down here. So if you do, then that you probably had some problems with your column loading or your column itself. Just to recap the differences between them. So in both of these cases, our beads are going to have a have pores and this really small thing are still going to have access to the pores. The bigger things will have access to some, but not all of the pores, especially in the case when you're doing um, one of these preparative um, analytical size exclusion columns where you're, the pores are basically sized in a range that you're going to have your proteins have differential access to these pores. So you're thereby separating the proteins. Whereas when you're doing a one of these like bulk separations, these group separations for desalting or buffer exchange. Here you're really just, sep the pores are really tiny and you're separating the really tiny things that have access to the pores from everything else. And so these tiny things can often be things um, like radioactive ATP from labeling reactions, EDTA or TRIS um, might interfere with, with downstream applications, um, various things like that. And so there are a lot of times in protein purification, for example, that you might want to remove things. For example, if you're kind of doing a series of chromatography steps where you start with some affinity chromatography, then you maybe want to go to ion exchange and then gel filtration. So then in this case, you're using gel filtration, but you're using the separative form, you're using the um, this other form, um, but same concepts, but remember that here you're actually separating proteins by size, and this is going to allow you to further purify it rather than just remove salts. Sometimes you use this desalting column, however, in between various steps, such as in between your affinity chromatography and your ion exchange chromatography. So within affinity chromatography, the idea is that your protein is going to bind specifically to the resin based on some feature, like maybe a his tag. And then you're going to compete it off. So with it in the in the example of a his tag, you would then compete it off with a midazol. And I have posts on that. I'm not going to go into it here, other than to say that you might not want all that imidazole um, because that could interfere with things like your ion exchange chromatography. And so you want to remove that imidazole before you do this ion exchange. However, that can be a pain. Um, and so there are a few different strategies to remove things like that. One of them is what we're talking about today. And another method that's commonly used is dialysis. Here you have a little pouch or one of these like cassettes with these membranes. And basically your protein can, can't get through the membrane, but little things can. And in this case, you're relying on diffusion though. So you're just relying on molecules that can move through, are going to move through, um, and they're going to move through until there's like an equilibrium, this dynamic equilibrium, or basically the concentration inside and outside of that little pouch are going to be equal. This is all just through random movement and it's relying on this principle of equilibrium. So you keep having to replace the, the buffer outside of here because the small things keep flowing out, but then they flow out till they reach this equilibrium or there's equal value with equal amounts of them inside and out. And so, since you've just put thing, taken things out, there's going to be more in, more out here. And so then you can still have stuff in here. And so then you keep having to replace the water or the buffer over and over and over. And you need these big volumes and it can be a real pain. Um, but it has the benefit that you're not actually losing, you have less risk of losing protein because you're not actually sticking it into a column or something where some of the column, some of the protein might be retained in the column. Um, instead here, it's all just in the pouch. Another advantage of dialysis in some circumstances is that you have more flexibility in terms of the volume that you use. 
especially if you use like a pouch you can put whatever volume you want into there as opposed to having to kind of use a volume that's dictated by the columns that you have available. Another option that can sometimes be used, um, it's not typically used for buffer exchange though, um, and it can be, um, is centrifugal ultrafiltration. So typically we use these like spin concentrators for concentrating our protein, but it's also, the principle here is that the membrane is, your protein's not gonna get through that membrane, but the small things can. But in this case, you are pulling those small things through, but not, I mean, your protein is still, there's still gonna be some of those left with your protein when you're done spinning and so what you're going to have to do is then you keep you add you spin it down and then you add buffer that you want it your protein to be in then you spin it down and then you keep adding um and do this again and again kind of like with dialysis except in this case um you're doing it you're kind of like pushing things through the membrane rather than just relying on diffusion but you still have to, and you keep having to add the volume because you're pulling out the liquid too. And in this case, so you can typically like three times should be enough to help um, to help equilibrate it. But once again, you're risking losing sample because you are because you are basically your sample can be sticking to the walls of these membranes, and it's never good to lose sample. Um, also, you could have problems if your protein's not happy at a higher concentration. Speaking of your protein not being happy, no matter which of these techniques that you're using for a desalting or a buffer exchange, you never base, you never want to go totally desalted. Um, your protein is not going to be happy if you just stick it in water. Um, so proteins need some salt to be happy. They need some other things to be happy. So this is why it's really important that you equilibrate your column um, with the buffer that you're wanting to use, or in the case of dialysis, you have the buffer that you want outside of the sac. If you're worried that your protein might crash out, you can try doing like a little sample of it first and maybe diluting it to the salt concentration that it's going to be at finally, um, and seeing if it's still happy. Um, and so that, because you don't want your protein to crash out. So how does desalting and buffer exchange work with these little, um, with these desalting columns? So these are often done in a spin format. Sometimes they're done in a gravity format. Sometimes they're done in little, like, um, little pre-packed columns that you can stick on an acta. So like a protein purifying machine, FPLC. Um, with those, you can also just kind of syringe into them. But the basic idea is that they come typically with some sort of storage buffer in them. And so all of those beads are gonna be filled up with that storage buffer. Sometimes these are packed with the storage buffer that you would want. Like, so with, a, with the columns that are packed for nucleic acid um, cleanup, those often have a buffer that is compatible with most downstream applications. So, this like elution buffer or whatever, um, trust DTA typically. And so that you might not, you once you elude out that buffer, then it might be okay to use it. And just if you're okay with your protein coming out in whatever liquid was in, or if you're okay with your nucleic acid coming out in whatever liquid was in here. Typically though with proteins, then you have, your proteins are gonna be more picky about what liquid they come out in. And you want them to come out in the buffer that you want. And so you want to equilibrate the resin with the buffer that you want. And so what you're going to do is you're actually going to apply and elute the buffer several times. And so you put the buffer that you want on, and then this is going to push out the buffer that you didn't want. But you have to do this several times in order to ensure that all of this got out. And at this point, you're going to have your column filled with the buffer that you want. Now the tech this is kind of going to vary based on your method as to how you're actually eluding things. So in the case of gravity flow methods, you're going to have volume around and in the pores of the liquid. So you're going to have this like liquid around the beads. With you have a spin method, however, because you're, you're kind of like applying this force, you're actually going to push the void, spin the void volume out so that you're only going to have liquid inside of the beads and not around them. And this is going to prevent you from having your sample be diluted. 
But in the case of a gravity flow, you're going to have that liquid around too. And so you're going to get some dilution of your sample. Um, and you can minimize dilution if you actually like collect fractions and look at them and see where the protein is coming out. But if you just collect the entire sample volume, then you're going to have your protein diluted potentially, especially because they tell you to like add stacker volume so that you're adding the volume, total volume that they recommend to ensure that all of the stuff is actually getting pushed out because you're relying on this gravity force. Whereas with the spin um, formats, they're actually, because you're using the spin, then you can actually um, get the void volume out. And so only the liquid that you put in, it's going to displace a similar amount of, it's going to displace that amount of liquid, but with the buffer that you want. And the, like the buffer that your stuff comes in with, it's going to get stuck in the resin, whereas the stuff that you, the bigger stuff is going to come out. No matter what collection method you're using, you want to make sure that you actually put a clean collection tube underneath. So if you're using some sort of gravity flow method, when you put your buffer in, like when you put your sample in, originally you're just displacing the liquid that you're just kind of like displacing, displacing the void liquid and stuff. And so your sample is actually nothing should be in that first, in the first um, amount of liquid that they tell you, like there's some, they give, they'll give you the volumes and stuff, but nothing should be in the first liquid. And then your protein should start coming out of the column. So with the spin columns, after you get rid of the void volume of buffer, so just the buffer that was around the beads, and then you apply your sample, your sample is not going to just like drip out. You, it, you need the force of the centrifuging. Um, but when you do that, then it's going to come out. And so you don't have to worry about collecting stuff after you don't have to worry about collecting like the old buffer that's coming out before your protein actually starts coming out or your nucleic acid starts coming out. And then the stuff that you want is going to be in this eluted liquid. And the stuff that you don't want is going to be in these beads. And the reason why it's in these beads is because you haven't, uh, because they're small and you haven't applied enough force for them to come out. If you were to keep doing this longer, or if you were to increase the speed of your centrifuge, say, these was, this stuff would come out. It's not like it's permanently stuck. It's just, it's just the same reason why you can have, you can equilibrate it with this, with whatever buffer you want and push this old buffer out. And then your stuff is gonna come out in the buffer that you want. The reason is because it's not like things are permanently stuck in here. They're just going to come out a lot slower. And so they're going to come out at the same time as the, so this little stuff that was trapped in the beads is gonna come out at the same time as the bigger stuff that couldn't go through any of the pores in the beads. And this is why you can get your stuff to a loot. So if you were to keep going, you would be able to collect the really tiny stuff. And if you're doing a method where you're collecting fractions or you're monitoring the UV on an act essay, then you would be able to see the different stuff come out eventually. And this also means that you can then potentially reuse some of these columns to, for another purpose. Of course, you wouldn't want to be reusing one of the columns that you're using for some sort of radioactive tag removal. Um, but, but I've used PD10s a lot over and over with, in undergrad. So let's look at a practical example of how these columns actually work and how we use these columns in practice. So they come in different formats. So the ones I use for like my um, nucleic acid stuff, and they also have ones for proteins, um, they're in these like spin column format. So these ones for really small samples are just like a, in a micro centrifuge um, tube format. They're also bigger ones. Um, so these ones aren't, these ones are just for gravity flow as far as I know. Um, but there are also ones like PD-10 columns I, that I used a lot in undergrad where they are, they can be used for either gravity flow or in a spin format. In this case, what you would do is you would have an adapter that actually allows it to go into a centrifuge tube and then you could use it in a centrifuge. It'll have an adapter like a ring that's gonna help hold it steady. Um, but those are gonna be a little smaller so they actually fit in one of these tubes that you can then collect in. Um, but so these you could use for grab with gravity flow, you just hook up, clamp them onto a column. There are also ones that you can use on an Acta um, or another FPLC machine, or you can even use those ones with a syringe. So I'm gonna show you with a G50 column and a really, really old one that expired like six years ago because I didn't want to be wasteful um, and use a new one. 
and you can also use like a G25 if you have smaller things that you want to, um, like your, the thing that you are trying to keep is smaller and so you want to make sure that it's not retained in the resin. So when you come, the you know, in the thing, in the box, there's like a little tube and so this is actually where the resin is. Then there's just like a little collection for your waste and like cap if you want to cap the waste. But you're going to need a clean centrifuge tube, micro centrifuge tube for like when you want to actually collect it. So in here, the resin is kind of slurry and you'll see like, especially if, if it, in the package it was like upside down or something, it's kind of all over the walls and on the lid. And so what you need to do is you need to vortex it to get the stuff like actually where you want it. So I like to do it like this, kind of like turn it around upside down to get stuff off the lid and really just kind of keep an eye on it because you want to make sure that all of it is going to be in the column because the column volume is really important that you have that full column volume um, when you are running things through. Um, you want the volume to be what you expect. It to you want the volume to be what you expect it to be. Speaking of volume, right now there's more volume than the actual column volume because it comes with the buffer already in it. So with these columns, they're designed for use for um, rapid buffer exchange or desalting, dye terminator or primer removal and the removal of labeled nucleotides from labeling reactions. So basically these are designed for when you are trying to remove things from like DNA or RNA after labeling or some other thing. And so they have this buffer, like this TE buffer, TRIF CDTA buffer, just like typical buffer. So it's already like pre-equilibrated with this buffer that should be fine for most applications. But if you wanted to use it for another application, um, then you would equilibrate it with the one you want. But right now, basically there's too much liquid in there. So we want to remove the excess liquid. Um, but first this is stoppered, which is why it hasn't just been like spraying all over the place. Um, and so you need to like snap this off and then what you actually do is you like quarter turn the lid of this and stick it in your collection tube. And now you're gonna centrifuge it um, according to the instructions. Okay, so you can see that like the void volume and like the volume, the extra liquid volume is come out. And so with the spin columns, because you're actually removing like the void volume, you're moving the liquid around the different beads, this is going to prevent dilution of your sample because now when your sample comes in, it's basically just going to displace the amount of liquid that you put in. Um, but now your protein is going to come out with, or your nucleic acid, whatever, is going to come out with it. Whereas the salts that you just put in are going to come out, are going to be stuck. And so your thing is going to be coming out of the buffer that was stuck in the beads, but only the volume that you put in. Um, so with these volumes, you put in like 12 to 50 microliters. Um, it varies based on your column size and stuff. Um, your protein should not be in here. Um, uh, well, it definitely won't be in here because you haven't put it in yet. But basically, I don't, I'm not exactly sure why they have the snap cap for this, other than that if you forget to put it in a clean tube, which I have done before, don't recommend, um, then you would, could put it in the tube. Yeah, so that time I had to, I then like put it through like different columns afterwards. It was a mess. But basically, put it in a clean tube and um, remember to label your tube. Um, and so, typically with these tubes as well, um, label the cap but don't label this part because then it's going to bleed in but then remember when you take off the lid that it needs to be associated with the cap that it was the the tube that it was on and so these are all like just little things that can like totally mess up your experiment if you're not really thinking and then you blah blah blah, blah. oh which tube was that so when you're sticking in the centrifuge too you want to stick these have a tendency to snap off so you want to stick them like going in um if you have a bunch kind of like angle them so that they're not all hitting each other okay so you stick it in your tube and now it's time to apply the sample what you want to do is you can see that kind of the the resin can kind of pull especially if it's like older it can kind of like pull apart from the wall you want to make sure that you're applying your sample into the middle and that you're not applying it down the side of the wall. If you apply it down the side of the wall, you're basically giving everyone a shortcut. And the point of this is that you don't want to give the little stuff a shortcut. You want to make them go through all the beads. So you want to make everything go through the column though. 
um, but that your your the bigger stuff is going to go around the beads but through the column but if you like put it down the side then everything is going around the column I mean like yeah around the column we want everything to go through through the column but they might go around the beads or inside the beads and so just to demonstrate that the the small thing should get stuck inside I have um this just a little comassi die so this is a, just a really little molecule and I'm just going to apply it to the center of the column. You don't want your pipette tip to actually touch the column. Um, you just want to apply it to like the center of the column. And now we're, I'm going to spin it. All right. So this didn't work perfectly because these columns are like really, really old, but you can see that most, so there's a little die in here, but you can see, uh, you can see that most of the die is still stuck in the column. Um, and the amount of liquid I put in has come out. And once again, there's a little of the dye in here because these columns, like I said, are like six years old. Or I mean like six years past their expiration date. Who knows how old they actually are. Um, but so the expiration dates actually do matter for these things, um, which is why I don't feel bad about using one of these for a demo. Um, but ideally the dye would all just be stuck in the top here and you wouldn't see any here. Um, and this is the basic idea is that that dye because it's really small is getting stuck in here um and so what's coming out is the liquid that was in there as well as the bigger things that couldn't get um that couldn't get into the pores and the resin so they were above the exclusion limit of the resin and so then they would come out um and since it was just water and dye it would just be like nothing except for what was in there um and that is the basic principle of this um desalting columns um yeah